Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present our studies and also to learn from all the pioneers in this area uh, who are directly involved in developing many protocols for IVF and IVM treatments and clinical sites. Because uh, my lab and my team are focusing on the basic mechanism, studying the basic mechanisms of uh, human germ cells. And this is a great opportunity for me to learn from the clinical scientists and in terms of what issue or what challenge do we have. So coming to these sections, I guess, and uh, most of the audience have the question of whether we can use stem cell, differentiating them to uh, either sperm or oocyte, and maybe putting them in clinical application. So I'd like to, hold, uh, like to ask you to hold this question to the end, maybe evaluating what we have, together with the talk from Professor Hayashi and Professor uh, uh, Xiaoyang uh, Zhao. And so, so I'd like to begin with an uh, introduction of uh, this, uh, our topics is in vitro differentiation of human embryonic stem cell into ovarian follicle light cells. Well, first of all, uh, just a quick reminder of the human germ cell development. We know that there are many features which are shared between mouse uh, germ cell development, which are uh, discussed in the first two talks in these sections. And we know that epiblast stem cells is the origins of our germ cell. So we got primordial germ cell from epiblast stem cells. Then after the migration to the future gonads, after going through multiple rounds of uh, mitotic divisions, then we have enough pools of germ cell, primordial germ cell. But at this stage, the germ cell, or what we call PGC, is a late PGC, getting ready to enter into meiosis, which is different from early PGC, when they are just uh, specified at the epiblast stem cell. Those are very early PGC, having different transcriptome, having different cellular programs. So then after entering into meiosis, here I have a, a PPT that divides this germ cell development into two different major stages, pre-meiotic development and post-meiotic development. And we also know that because of the sex different, uh, male germ cell and female germ cells go into different programs, uh, actually around this stage, let PGC. The female germ cells will go into meiosis in fetal ovary, but the male germ cell will go into mitotic arrest and wait until uh, be, uh, after birth to enter meiosis. But after completing meiosis, both male and female will go through the meiotic division uh, from a diploid, they will become haploid cells of sperm or oocyte. So we have done, uh, we have learned a lot from model organism, from yeast all the way to monkey primates, and we learn meiosis from yeast. Studying this is what I did in my PhD, studying uh, meiotic recombination initiations uh, from budding yeast, and also a great deal about germ cells development in mouse. So those are most of the conserved mechanism between this model organism and human. But we also know that there are many non-conserved mechanisms between human and model organism, such as, for one instance, the genetic compositions that we, is required for germ cells. For a good uh, example, mm -hmm. DAZ, DAZ, deleted in exospermia genes, only present in primate Y chromosome, but not in mouse or other model organisms. And also recent study, uh, Xiaoyang also saw this uh, in his slide, that uh, SOC17, one of the uh, endometrics uh, actually 
uh, marker lineage initially known for somatic cell lineage express also require for human early PGC specification in Solani studies and in cyto study recently. But that gene is not required for mouse uh, early PGC specifications. And also in recent studies, cyto also found that EOMES, one of the uh, end of the marker, or maybe uh, those markers are also expressed in the human uh, germ cells. Human PGC, required for human PGC, but not in mouse. So those are many examples that have been elucidated recently that they are different between species. So in order to study the human germ cell development better, we need a human base system if we can use a human germ cells, uh, human embryonic stem cell, differentiating them into germ cells, we might have a better understanding of human germ cell development and compare that. Of course, we are still based our knowledge on the model organisms such as mouse uh, germ cell development. We have learned a great deal and tremendous study from that. So having that in mind, what that goes, we are building this in vitro system, first using human embryonic stem cell, because compared to other stem cell, we know that the pluripotency of uh, human embryonic stem cell should be uh, higher compared to other uh, somatic lineage such as uh, MSC. So they might have a higher chance of developing into germ cell, complete the germ cell uh, cycles. So uh, in 2009, we published this data in uh, Rene Rehopela's lab. Using human embryonic stem cell, uh, we tried th four different lines, two male and two female lines, uh, from actually from Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. And we are integrating this reporter, uh, VASA reporter system. This VASA uh, genes is an RNA helicase expressed specifically in late germ cells. So having this uh, promoter uh, fusing to an EGFP and a 3' UTR, we should be able to get a specifically expressed uh, EGFP cells that will only be induced by the BMP factors. So after adding BMP4 and A, uh, we found that they can be induced. A small population, about 5% of this population, has expressed EGFP, and we were able to isolate this uh, EGFP population, and then went to different assay to test and compare whether those cells have any properties that are known to be PGC, primordial germ cells. So we compare their expression profile, epigenetic status, and even put them back uh, to grow them uh, on MAP, and we found that those properties are similar to what we know about human germ cells. So these are some of the data showing that uh, if we put this GFP back to the MAP, they grow as a tight colonies, uh, smaller and more condensed than the human embryonic stem cell colonies, and the uh, alkali phosphatase activity actually actually higher than human embryonic stem cells. And after seven days of the replating on MEF, the G uh, cells are still expressing EGFP. So we able to isolate isolate these cells with the EGFP expressions. Then we also compare in vivo, looking at certain master regulator in this period, especially for human. So for the mouse study and other study, we have been focusing on mostly the transcription factor. But here we are focusing the RNA binding protein because this RNA binding protein has been reported to be a licensing factor uh, for the cells to enter into meiosis. So Dazzle is one of the uh, three, one of the member of the three genes family, Dazzle, Bu, and uh, Dase. So there's all expressed in early PGC, starting from early PGC. So if we compare the human feeder ovary at week 12 
week 16 and 20, we found that Dazzle uh, expressed the cells population are increasing with the Dazzle positive populations. And if we use the, in the same ovary, standing for OC4, the pluripotent markers, we found that these pluripotent markers, uh, positive populations are declining. So if you look closely, those cells that express highly the Dazzle in the cytoplasm are not expressing the OC4 pluripotent markers. So uh, they seem to be mutually exclusive and suggesting that when the Dazzle are expressed at a high level, that might be closing the pluripotent uh, programs. Then we tested this by the in vitro uh, assay. So just now was in vivo looking at the human ovary. Now we use a human embryonic stem cell. Overexpress Dazzle or silencing Dazzle to see what is the effect on the pluripotent marker of OC4, nanot, and PRDN14. So if you compare to the control, uh, having differentiation with, uh, undergoing with the BMP, day 2, 4, 6, and 8, OC4, nanots, and PRDM are all declining in the in vitro differentiation assay. But if we overexpress Dazzle, the blue line, you can see that that even decreased faster than the control. Mm -hmm. And if you silence Dazzle, now you have the OC4 at a higher level. So this is inconsistent with the mouse study that I did not show here. That when you knock out Dazzle in mouse, you have the pluripotent marker uh, expressed at a high level. So suggesting again that Dazzle as RNA binding protein uh, regulating the pluripotent C-cell cycle at the early PGC stage. Then we check the protein level, so just now was the transcription level, we also checking the OC4 protein level when we overexpress Dazzle, and that uh, we saw that Dazzle can decrease OC4 protein uh, level in the human embryonic stem cell over, after overexpression. So this is also OC4 and nanot for Western. And how do they regulate this uh, protein? Just now we have this pluripotency marker. So we think that uh, Dazzle is regulating this pluripotency marker. At the same time, having the early PGC going into late PGC. So one of the marker downstream of Dazzle is VASA, RNA binding protein that I mentioned just now, RNA helicase. So the 3' UTR of VASA was fused uh, to a low surface. And in the control, without having Dazzle overexpression, you found that the level is at the base level. When you overexpress them, you induce the luciferase assay. But if you have the mutation that was associated with POI patient, or POF patient, or F48A and R115G, now you decrease the luciferase activity. So again, uh, showing that Dazzle is regulating the downstream genes now through the 3' UTR of these genes. And SYCP3 also was reported for Dazzle as a downstream target uh, at the 3' UTR in mouse. So having all this data and the data that I did not show you uh, today, we have this model that Dazzle is playing an important role during this proce uh, process of early PGC transition to late PGC and then promoting them into meiosis. So doing two jobs. One is shutting down the pluripotency programs. Another one is inducing the meiosis program. So can we apply this uh, to our goal that we want to in vitro differentiate human embryonic stem cell to oocyte, the female uh, germ cells. So if we can first induce the cells by using BMP extrinsic factor, make them into PGC, then induce them into meiotic germ cells, having dazzle in these cells, 
then we should be able to put them into early uh, meiotic germ cells and then maybe adding other extrinsic factors such as BMP15, GDF9 and promoting genesis in the in vitro culture system. So this is our uh, strategy simplified in these figures. So another important player in this uh, our protocol is another protein, uh, Bu, one of the member RNA binding protein member that I uh, mentioned just now, similar to Dazzle, is also expressed in human, specifically expressed in human germ cells. But the expression is different between mouse and human to add this to make that more complicated. <laughs> in mouse, uh, Dazzle and Bu uh, expression is overlapping, but in human, it's not completely overlap. When uh, Bu is uh, highly expressed, Dazzle is shut down. So, especially in the cells that enter into meiosis. So, we are guessing that Bu is uh, regulating meiosis. So, Dazzle in human, they have to bring the cells into meiosis, but then uh, Bu will take over and regulating the cells uh, during meiosis. So, then we check again in the in vivo standing uh, in human feeder ovary and see if the pattern are consistent with our hypothesis and we found that the bull distribution is actually what we uh, think uh, they should be located in the inner uh, cortex of the human feeder ovary. So then we use this two RNA binding protein, Dazzle and Bu, which are important for inducing human embryonic stem cell into meiosis, overexpress them in human embryonic stem cell, and check whether these cells population have changed by using flow cytometry. And you can see that after overexpression of Bu and Dazzle together, and after six days of differentiation, you, you have a higher population entering to 4N, uh, uh, signal that the cells are entering into meiosis, one of the uh, signals that indicating uh, or suggesting the cells are entering into meiosis in vitro. Then we also have other assay, uh, run further assay to confirm whether those cells are really entering into meiosis by using protein markers, PRDM9, SYCP3, and gamma h 2 x are the known marker. So PRDM9 is the one of the protein that is responsible the, to initiate uh, myotic recombination, double strand break. And then SYCP3 is the main component of the SC, and the gamma h 2 x indicate double strand break. So all these markers are all, uh, highly expressed in the induced uh, embryonic stem cell, meaning they are overexpressing Dazzle and Bu and having BMP. Then we also further do a meiotic spread and uh, double stand gamma h 2 x SYCP3, MLH1, the mismatch repair protein to see if those are uh, those show any expected pattern. And you can see elongated SC standing using SYCP3 and the MLH1 foci uh, uh, colloquializing with the SYCP, most of them. <coughs> so then we have uh, evidence that now, if we overexpress Dazzle and Bu and having BMP4 and A, we can induce the human embryonic stem cell from a pluripotent state to enter into meiosis. Can we further bring them into uh, the late cells? Because again, coming to this, we know that granuloso cells, the somatic cells surrounding oocyte or the female germ cell are essential for follicular genesis. So we also know that they are from other study, uh, human embryonic stem cell or mouse embryonic stem cell can self-organize into different organoid-like cells, organoid entity that have a, a order that might be communicating between each other. So this gives us hope that maybe if we induce them in our embryonic stem cell culture, in vitro culture, we should be able to get somatic cells 
and germ cell together in our culture. So then we are looking for the extrinsic factor that, may, that might promote granulosa cells appearance and follicular genesis. Then looking at the mouse study, we know that there are many um, growth factors, especially the TGF beta superfamily members, including GDF9, BMP15, are uh, essential for the follicular genesis. So we choose GDF9 and BMP15, and especially using the heterodimer that Martin Mazuk had reported and used them. So initially, we also used homodimer, and the homodimer also can induce folli follicles, light cells, and we compare both the homodimer and heterodimer and found that heterodimer actually gave us a higher efficiency with a, a faster uh, follicular appearance. So this is what we did. So initially using the undifferentiated human embryonic stem cell ha having BMP4 and uh, 8A, one hour, overexpressed diazole and bull selection, then uh, at day six of differentiation, adding BMP15 and GDF9, we saw this uh, follicle light cells appearing. So these are different follicle light cells in our cultures. And the B and C, B is the control without adding these inducing factors. You don't see these follicle structures and C is the uh, lower magnification of this stereo microscope uh, pictures of uh, our culture system. With the higher magnification, you can see uh, morphologies uh, resembling um, follicles with multiple layers. So we also tested, so that one was a H9 line, uh, Jamie Thompson H, uh, H9 line. We also tried UCSF line, uh, another UCSF, uh, HSF6 line, and they also give us uh, uh, follicle light cells and with these structures, and some of them you can see multiple layers surrounding a big cells in the center. So if you pick up these cells with the cellular microscope and then put them into suspension, you would see this uh, cell aggregate in the suspension cultures. And if we count the follicle appearance in our differentiation protocol from day seven to 15, we see a peak of the appearance of these follicle light cells around day 11 to 13. Then we do a whole genome transcriptome analysis of these follicle light cells, including the surrounding cells together, because we try to isolate this uh, center oocyte, but it's found that it's very tightly bound with the surrounding cells. Then we um, just took the whole cell aggregate and with the less surrounding cells and use them for the uh, transcriptome analysis. And the uh, left two is the ES cells. Center meter two are spontaneously differentiated with, without the inducing factor. And then the right two are the follicle light cells, uh, two different lines, HSF6 and H9. So this is the uh, geotherms, and we found that they are enriched for this uh, female reproductive genes. And also we compare that to an independent study, uh, PCA, Principal Component Analysis, uh, with other groups. So they also analyze uh, the follicle light cells from human that took out the uh, follicle from uh, ovary. And then these two are the follicle light cells from, their uh, from our study and the primordial follicle primordial oocyte from their study, and the M2 oocyte from other study. And this is the spontaneous differentiated from our study, and ES cells, granulosa cells. So our follicle light cell from this uh, in vitro differentiated are closer to primordial and M2 oocyte, and uh, different from the granulosa cells reported from other independent study. So although the distance are still not very close uh, in terms of PCA analysis. Oh, we also did uh, real-time PCR to check 
uh, specific markers for follicles, including SOHLH2, uh, transcription factor, Norbox, uh, H1FOO, and GP2, general Pelosla 2 genes, uh, CYP19A, RSP01. All these genes are enriched in the FLC uh, transcription. Then we check the, whether this FLC can secrete any extra diol in the cultures, and then we collect these cells uh, medium at day two, six, and nine after having a uh, after differentiating at day 12, we collected the medium. Then uh, checked the extra diol expression and found that they have a higher uh, extra diol expression compared to the control. Then we look at other marker that might indicate uh, human oocytes or uh, follicle, including the ZP2 uh, protein immunostaining and we found that our in, in vitro differentiated cells uh, on this have this uh, standing pattern uh, indicating ZP2 expression. And uh, granulosal cells marker MH directly stand on the differentiated cultures and you see that most of the MH standing are uh, in this neighborhood of our uh, FLC. And also Norbox, the transcription factor specially expressed in uh, oocyte. Uh, so this is the pattern that we saw in the Norbox. And the diameter of this uh, follicle light cells is around 100 and some of them are 87 micron. So after having this FLC, we we would like to try whether they can be further differentiated. So we try to transplant them into mouse kidney capsule uh, to see if they can further differentiate. So the initial pattern that we uh, estimate or the differential dif developmental stage that we estimated will be about primordial follicle. So we would like to see if they can go further. So we transplant them under kidney capsule and then after 60 days of uh, transplantation, we took out the transplant compared to the mouse kidney uh, and the control transplant without any induced cells. You don't see any pattern like this in the control transplant and close to the kidney. And this is our induced transplant with a lower magnifications and higher magnifications. And this might be the GV. So we did, uh, after the transplant, we took out the transplant and those sections, no box standing of the transplant. So we uh, saw the no box expression and also AMH expression in those transplant FLC, showing a granulosal cells pattern surrounding our uh, FLC. So this is what we have so far. And we think that even after transplant into mouse kidney, we still get mostly the primordial follicles or primary follicles, uh, starting from human embryonic stem cells. And we still have to work very hard to get a <laughs> further differentiated stage. And so meanwhile, we are trying to, uh, we are collaborating with many physicians and clinicians and to study the mutation that are associated with infertility, including MHR, Norbox, BRDT, and uh, KD, KHDR, BS1, which is also known as SAM68. Those uh, mutations are initially associated with the, some of them are sporadic uh, infertility patients, and then we identify the molecular mechanism behind this uh, mutation and the cause of the infertility. And some of these mutation that uh, we haven't published, they are uh, associated with the genes in the early uh, germ cell development. So that might be the 
those genes that we can use our primitive uh, differentiation system to study. And we are welcoming any collaborations that uh, can use our system at least to study uh, the genetic mutation. And coming back to the question of whether we can use this FLC for clinic, uh, the answer is no at this stage. If you ask me whether we can use this FLC, for any transplantation or making any baby, the answer is no. So we still need to work very hard and get uh, past many tests. And I'd like to thank my graduate student and postdoc who put a tremendous work in this uh, project and also collaborator, uh, Professor Sun Wei, uh, Martin Mazuk, Fu Chou Tang, uh, Bingbing Wang, and Yun Xiaochao for this project. Thank you.